All right then, let's get started. Good evening, everybody. I'm Holly Kwan, and I'm here at the Sheep River Library in Turner Valley in conversation with my friend and fellow writer, Doris Daly. So, as you may know, April is Poetry Month, and this talk is a special presentation in honor of Cowboy Poetry Week, which is the third week of April. Cowboy Poetry Week is recognized across Canada and the U.S. with a variety of events, observations, and celebrations. And we are so fortunate to have an exceptional cowboy poet right here in our midst. Doris Daly is an award-winning cowboy poet, one of the few who actually makes her living in the field. She's just back from an extensive tour of Colorado, Nevada, Texas, and Utah. She has a local show coming up on May 6th, which I'll tell you a little bit more about toward the end of our program. And she has a new book out as well, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So I'm delighted to be here in conversation and we'll also have an opportunity for people to ask questions at the end of our presentation. So if you have some questions, jot them down or keep them in mind, you'll get your chance. So, hi Doris. Hello Holly, hello everybody. So, we'll have, I have lots of questions for you, but let's get started with a poem. Do you want to start with? I will get started with the poem, but first, first things first, which is to um, wish my brother happy birthday. Queen Elizabeth and Mark have a birthday tomorrow, so happy birthday, Mark. Whoa. Hey. Should <laughs> we sing? Uh, no, we won't <laughs> sing. We won't, we won't sing so um, anyway, nice to see my family and friends from the south. So Holly asked me to start off with a poem, and I'll start off with an old, old nugget, um, which is suitable for May, for April and May. It's a springtime poem, and it's the rudest. It's the rudest poem I ever wrote. So oh, let's get that. Let's get, let's out get that over with. Yeah, right. Yes. Um, I, I bet everybody's heard this one, and it it harkens back to the time when we were children on the ranch, and my dad hired a hired man from Three Rivers, Trois Rivières. He was French Canadian. We loved him. We thought he was full of fun, but he didn't last long, and here's the sad tale of Pierre. I remember the year we hired Pierre, a dashing French cowboy from old Trois Rivières, a 10-gallon chapeau and a dashing mustache. He rode with the land and he roped with panache. A stout-hearted fellow with je ne sais quoi, a hybrid of cowboy and courier de bois. He'd laugh and he'd sing, he'd joke and he'd babble, never mind the emphasis was on the wrong syllable. He was well loved by all and we wished he would stay, so the mystery remains why he left us that day. It was early in spring, the lambs had done great, time to bob off their tail and alter the fate of little Fleecy and Snowflake. So with surgery done, the nuggets were broiled, served up on a bun. Ooh la la, sang Pierre, this lunch is delish. What do you call such a marvelous dish? Lamb fries, said Cookie, here help yourself, they don't last too long on the old cookhouse shelf. Well, later in May, the scene was repeated, branding was done, and the cowboys were treated to oysters. Culinary first for Pierre, magnifique, he called out why they taste like trottier. Cookie explained how he breaded and fried them, calf fries, he said, you haven't lived till you tried them. Well, it was new to Pierre, this cuisine de la range, lamb fries, then calf fries, it was all a bit strange, but he had to admit the taste was first rate, but wonderful morsels would next grace his plate. Well, he didn't wait long. The very next day, a wonderful fragrance was wafting his way. Would it be a ragu or an airy souffle? The smell from the stove foretold something gourmet. What's for lunch, Pierre called out, and what he heard made him wince. French fries, said Cookie. Pierre hasn't been seen or heard of since. <laughs> yeah, we've got that one. Describe yourself as a poet, speaker, and traveler. Do these words accurately describe you and your life? And if not, what other words would you use to describe yourself? Well, if, if you asked anybody what three words would sum you up, uh, those would be three good ones. What did I say? Poet, poet, speaker, speaker, traveler. traveler. Um, those, those, that's a good start. Um, <laughs> 
I would say I'm also a gypsy and a bit of a pilgrim and um, a good neighbor and a friend. And I am a, I'm a, I'm sort of a professional eavesdropper. That's part of my job is to watch and listen to the world around me because you never know if that might be the next thing to write about. Hmm. And an observer, clearly, if you're telling the story of Pierre and the things that, so these things go into your head and kind of roll around in there. They do, and you know, when I write, I need to, I often put five words across the top of my page, which are sight, touch, scent, um, but anyway, anyway whatever, yeah, whatever, whatever, the five senses, ones, yeah. the five ones. <laughs> Because um, I, I feel like that's my job is to bring my listener or to my, my reader into the story and hopefully they can, you know, smell the branding iron or see the clouds racing across the sky. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit then, you, you obviously um, uh, adhere to what they say to writers, which is show, don't tell. So tell me a little bit about your background as a writer. How did you get started? Um, I started writing in third grade, and um, some of the people in Claire Selmer will remember Mary Lawton. And so Mrs. Lawton gave us third graders a homework, which was to write about our new vocabulary, which was Arctic words, igloo and parka and, um, oh, something else. Kayak. Uh, kayak, Kayak's probably, right. yep. <laughs> and my little paragraph rhymed, and my mom and dad picked up on that and gave me a little rhyming dictionary, and I started writing skits and stories and poems and great Nancy Drew sequels and uh, fabulous dramas for the fourth and fifth and sixth graders. Your mom is going, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, <laughs> oh, I think back to how many kids I bossed around saying, you're going to play this role and you're going to be in this role. <laughs> but just, and even going with dad back in the days when we still had a grain crop across the highway, if I was in the truck waiting, I'd be writing stories and not 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 to make too light of it but writing was easy for me so I wrote things for kids on the school bus if they would do my math homework it was I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend it but it's how it works for me <laughs> so um, rhyming was always something that appealed to you did you always write poetry so you wrote you I think I had things but you seem to have an ear I did I had a musical ear I think and um I, I loved rhyming words, not everybody. You know, some kids are born just to be a, a superstar hockey player, and some are going to be born to play the violin. And I'm not saying I was born to, to rhyme words, but it was just an innate. It came to you. It, it was, yeah. yeah. And then in Excuse seventh grade. Excuse me. Just wait. Excuse me. Could you tell oh, the people yes. in the background to be quiet? Because the sound here is very poor. Are there people in the room talking? No, no people next no, door. No, there's nobody. No. Sorry. Okay. No. Okay. Look, look, Sorry. Look, 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 Go ahead. Speak louder. Yeah. You look good. Oh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks, mom. Um, um, so tell me a little bit then. So with with an innate uh, ability to uh, to rhyme, then what led you to cowboy poetry specifically? Um, I'll I'll back up from that a little bit and and remind people about what uh, the whole notion of memorizing poetry. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if kids do that anymore. I, I hope they do. Um, in seventh grade with Mrs. DeMar, we had to memorize two or maybe three verses of um, a Robert Service poem. Mm -hmm. And boy, I caught onto that just lickety split. And you and Sam McGee. You yes, I, Sam, <laughs> Sam became my best friend, and I memorized all 15 verses. It became a great, great weapon to use against my brother and sister. There you go. I want to sit by the door. No, I want to sit by the door. There are strange things. Okay, you can sit by the door. Um, but aside from a, like a silly little anecdote like that, it was easy for me to memorize. How do I know? Because I am only me. But I'm guessing memory work is easier for me than it is for some. Mm -hmm. But by golly, I work, I work at it every single day. And when I'm driving down the road, I'm, I'm not just driving singing la 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 to whatever is on CKUA. I'm, I'm practicing my poetry. Mm -hmm. So um, I, had, I had cadence and meter and rhyme just stuck in my head. And then when I came 
back to Alberta after a long st uh, stint away in, uh, in um, Pennsylvania and mm -hmm. Ontario. Mark and Jan were going to Pincher Creek to a cowboy gathering, and I said, what the heck is a cowboy poetry gathering? I'd never, I mean, why hadn't I heard of it? I was a ranch kid, I love poetry. And so I went out of curiosity, but I, I also love to dance, and so does my family. And so they said, oh, if nothing else, there's going to be a great dance there that night, and anybody who does a poem at the microphone, they get a free ticket to the dance. Oh, so perfect. I said, sign me up. And the rest. It's, it's it's that it was that it was that unplanned. Wow, that's so there was kind of a collision of, of different parts of your life and that's and that's a good way of saying it. Yeah, that's a good way of saying it, Holly. My 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 ranch, my my Western background, my Western upbringing. I don't want to pretend that I'm a real. I'm the cream puff cowgirl. <laughs> I'm not the real deal cowgirl for sure, but certainly that's all I knew growing up. My <laughs> love of go into a good dance, my love of poetry. And you know, I wanted to go, not to recite my poetry, but to listen to everybody else's. Sure. And that yes. became my, that initially became my reason to write more and more poems, because I thought, oh, if I just increase my repertoire, I'll get invited back next year, mm -hmm. which was my free way of going to listen to. And you get to hear all yes, this great yeah, stuff yeah. that other people are yeah, producing. Yeah, right. so I was well motivated, and then. Rose. And then I started getting invitations to go and, and recite it for, um, oh, I remember I did the Anglican Women's something or other in Fort McLeod and 4-H uh, Club in Cremona and little jobs around Calgary. And then my big break. Um, well, I'll back up. I, I, was, I went to Pincher Creek several years in a row. Um, there was a lovely, fabulous cowboy poetry event that happened at Calgary at the... Um, Convention center for maybe just three years, oh, two or three years, that. yes. It, and then the town fathers shut it down. They huh. thought that Calgary didn't need too much fun. Western. Yeah, right. that was great. Wowie, that's where I met Dale Evans. That was a really that was a memory. That was a, wow. That was that was fabulous. And boy, oh boy, she was a she didn't disappoint. Everything that everything that a young girl wanted Dale Evans to be growing up, she she was when I met her and I've, I've met her daughter Cheryl several times now and um, just salt of the earth genuine people at any rate um, that was that was a good experience for me and then I was invited to Elko Nevada for my very first kind of big show in 98 maybe or 99 wow. and that changed everything for yeah me. yeah so coming on 20 years ago yeah wow <laughs> so so you make your living now as a poet tell me a little bit about what what is that work involved? Uh, maybe a typical day, if there is such a thing, is the typical day in the life of a cowboy poet. What what's the work like? How do you structure your day? How do you physically write a poem? Well, writing the po writing a poem is one percent of what I do. <laughs> um, when I walk out on stage to do a forty five minute show, say, or a sixty minute show. I don't think people have any clue as to how many hours, how many invisible, to them, the invisible hours that go into one hour walking out on stage to do the FADA performance. So, um, updating my website, sending bios. Right now I've got two contracts at home on my kitchen table that need to be corrected and initialed and reset and, and back and forth. Um, trying to update um, a, a lot. I, I, I do a lot of, not I won't call it consulting, but people send me manuscripts and say, would you like to write the foreword for my book? Oh, well, yes. yeah, I'd love to write the foreword for your book. Of course, <laughs> but that's, or Doris, we'd like to have, um, we'd like to have you in on our, our anthology to celebrate the 25th anniversary, the 30th anniversary of Elko, which they just did. Great, I'd love to do that. Well, which ones and sending them to anyway? There's a lot of prep work. And business. Yes. There's the business side of the life. And then there's getting gigs. So right. so when I get hired, say in Alpine, Texas, the first thing I do is I get to work and try to think of who all I know that maybe this is the year where I'll get a job in Weatherford, Texas, or in New Mexico, or try to put a tour together. So there there's hours of I could work at this eight hours a day every day, and you'd never see me on stage. 
So do you do you work uh, outside the cowboy poetry genre? Do you other, do other kinds of writing, or are you you pretty focused now on on this? I do. Show? I do. I, I do. Um, I've worked as a professional editor. Love, I yes. love, love, love that work, proofreading and editing other people's things mm -hmm. for publication. Love that. Love that. <laughs> so if anybody wants any hint <laughs> that I could edit for you, an annual report or a magazine article, love doing that. Um, but you know, with only so many hours sure enough, yeah. devoted to write, and I and I even um, now commissions pay, so mm -hmm. so I certainly like for people to call me and say, can you write something for our 20th wedding anniversary? Will you write something for our town's 100th anniversary? And yes, I will. The downside of something like that is that poem's only good for one airing. If I'm writing for your right. birthday party, right. once I've, and that takes the same amount of work as something that gets into the repertoire. Sure. So mm -hmm. I, I've learned to charge a hefty price for Do those. you find yourself writing at certain times of day? Uh, are you a night owl? Or are you a morning person? Does okay, that... Not a night owl. Not a night owl. <laughs> right. In fact, can we go now? <laughs> and uh, um, I, so not to be glib, uh, I, I write under desperation. Mm -hmm. So Me too. So Deadlines like with, are my friend. Yeah, deadlines are my friend. Or repeat engagements when I know 700 people will be at Elko again, mm -hmm. to the, I better have three or four new ones for mm -hmm. them. So, you know, I, I, don't, I don't dislike, I, the best part of writing for me is when it's over with. Yeah. I, I like doing it, but boy, after a day when I've done it, oh, yay, yeah. love that feeling. It's such a, it's, it's in your head, it gets out onto paper, yeah. you massage it, play with yeah. it, and it's, yeah, I, I agree, it's, oh, yeah. okay, I can forget about all those thoughts and move on to the yeah. next one. Yeah. And I'm happy to edit it the next day, revise mm -hmm. it. And of course, the piece isn't finished for me until I recite it 20 times. Sure. Because something that I think is fabulous on the page could be a, not a dud, maybe, but oh. until I say it out loud. The voicing of it. The voicing mm -hmm. of it. My tongue might trip in places where I right. never anticipated. Um, late, high River, is the sound any better? No. Okay, sorry. We'll speak up. <laughs> There's still a background noise. There are voices. Yes. There are, it sounds like children's voices from coming from another room. That's yeah, what it that's sounds like in here. There, I asked. Can you hear us? Yeah, we can, but yeah. we'll just have to speak over them. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I, it's, they're, just they're, very, uh, it's just very distracting, that's all. We have to really focus on you, and we okay. are. And we okay. are. Good. Okay, then. <laughs> um, so, Doris, you traveled quite a bit, especially to the U.S., so um, I'm guessing you know a little bit about perhaps the uh, advantages and disadvantages of working in the U.S. versus working in Canada, and I'm thinking here of the, perhaps the number and variety of uh, poetry events. Um, well, I go where the job is. Sure. And so I do work a lot in the U.S. because that is where some of the job. But I would work in Canada too. I, like no, I I'll, if it's if the job is 30 miles away or 300 miles away, and if it's in Fort Saint John or or Reno, Nevada, or Ottawa, it, it doesn't matter to me. I go wherever the wherever. job is. Right. And, and the smallest little campfire is just as much fun mm -hmm. to me as the biggest convention center, so I am no, um, I'm not prejudicial about any, I love them all, I love them all. Um, the West is just a bigger place in the United States, when you think Texas, Utah, Colorado, California, Montana, or there's just more West. And do you drive when I, you go um, to these events? you mostly drive? Mostly I fly and then rent a car, oh, yes. or depending on the situation, sometimes two or three of us will meet at an airport and then we'll rent a car and sure, do a job cargo. together. Yeah. Um, sometimes I'm renting the car. So, there's just there's just too many dis, there's just too many miles in sure. between the gig yeah. to, to to drive from yeah. A to B. Well, and and speaking of many miles, you also did a trip to Ireland and filmed a, a documentary. Can you tell us a little bit about that film and what what was that about? 
Well, that was a great experience. Um, it's the, the movie's done. It's called I Found My Tribe. There's a filmmaker from down in southern Alberta, and she she wanted to tell, she used me to tell her, this was the story she wanted to tell. When something's just in you to do, where does that come from? So if you were a Sutter and you were born in Viking and everybody in your family was a hockey player and yet you wanted to be a concert pianist, there, there's something in you that was just there. It's not just your environment. So here I was, the daughter of ranching people, not performers or writers, and I just was a young girl, was writing and performing. Where did that come from? Mm. So the documentary filmmaker followed me around uh, here in Canada and, and, did, and we filmed some shows in Utah, I think. And there was her idea to go to um, Ireland because Daly is an Irish name. And she said, what will we find there? Maybe the Irish, I mean, they're known for having the gift of the gab. And so it was not a trip to find my people on exactly my family tree. But we went to an old, old county, County Meath, in the heart of the country, and found um, lots of dailies, and including a historian who said, daily, oh, if, you're, if you make your living as a rhymed and metered poet, if you, rhymed, if you make up stories and they have a rhyme and a meter, you get that from your father's side because that's what dailies were in medieval Ireland. Oh, for him, so. Yeah, that's a wow. da dailies were occupational bards. That was their job. Wow. So they worked for the O'Sullivans or the O'Clancy's, and you would be shut away in a dark room and have to come up with a story that maybe exalted the chieftain or made the village look great in battle or harvest time. And so the O'Dailies were poets. And so there's some kind of line well, going through, but there's also, uh, I would imagine, travel by itself also must influence your work and some of the beautiful landscapes in the West and the people you meet. Can you talk about that a little bit, the influence of travel? Sure. Well, before I, some of, a lot of you know that before I started doing more and more and more poetry, I worked for a group called 10,000 Villages, which is a Nonprofit fair trade organization. So a business trip for me was to northern Thailand or I, I don't know the garbage dumps of Manila or El Salvador or Kenya, many many places in the third world. And I thrived on that, loved that. It was an honor to to work for them. And it makes you a keen observer. Um, and it also so a couple of things. It makes you appreciate coming home to what we really have, mm -hmm. but Wherever I went, that was somebody else's home, which which they loved very much as well. So I think I think all the travel I've done has made me realize that everybody loves where they live, not just Westerners. And so it's all fine and dandy for for cowboys to love the life they live, and they should, and we do. And I love my little Western town, but I think I have a sort of a broad view of life to think that. Everywhere I've gone, people love where they live. The Amish love Lancaster County, and the people I met in Honduras love their cashew farms, yes. and um, the performers that I worked with um, at the Smithsonian Institute love Washington, D.C. So, so part of that makes me think that I, I want to write, I want to be the kind of writer where, where what I write is universal, so you... So even though I'm using cowboy lingo, and I'm, I hope I'm doing an okay job of, of painting the West that I truly do love, I hope anybody who listens to my work can buy in. And apply it to where they live. Yeah. And, and so yeah. you're building really on people's energy and, and their, their love of place, their love of family, and those are universal values. They are, yeah. So if I'm doing a poem about my grandma, it's anybody's It's grandma. anybody's grandma, yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of poem, do you want to read another one? Well, I'll do a brand new one. Speaking of grandmas, I'll do my brand new grandpa poem. Thank you, Kayla. Um, okay, I think it's going to be better now, Hi River. Thank you. Uh, so I wrote this one in late December, under the gun, because I, I set myself a goal. I'm going to write something new for, for Christmas, just for my own family. And um, when I did it for my niece, she said, oh, Aunt 
Auntie Mo's going to be crying by the end of that one. <laughs> and she was wrong because Auntie Mo was crying by the first verse. Um, but so all, I, all I'll say is I did it for my family. But but again, if any of you have a grandpa, uh, then you can be thinking of your grandpa. And all, all I'll say about this one is um, some of you knew my grandpa, Paul. He was the wheat pool elevator agent in Granham and then um, Cardston. I wouldn't normally, the fourth line in this poem, I would not normally put those words down and put them in a poem. But Grandpa said this a lot, and so it made it into the poem. Grandpa wasn't perfect, but he sure came mighty close. He doled out love to grandkids with a big and generous dose. When one of us did anything to brighten up his week, he had tears as big as horse turds coursing down his cheek. <laughs> <laughs> He did what all good grandpas do and did it all with zest. He was unapologetic. His grandkids were the best. We play and sing and dance and twirl and race and rope and ride. And Grandpa cheered, our biggest fan, no matter what we tried. But the best thing Grandpa did, and it mightn't sound like much, was to tell us that when he had died, he'd like to keep in touch. He came up with a wily plan. He'd clear it with the boss and come back as a coyote. So our trails would sometimes cross. Well, we thought this was hilarious and teased him through the years until the day the phone call came. Then laughter turned to tears. Well, that was 40 years ago, and I can testify there's been many grandpa sightings <laughs> as the decades roll on by. Just when I need a boost or my luck is running thin, a coyote often comes in view. That's Grandpa checking in. When the stars are brightly shining or the night is cold and long, I smile in the darkness when I hear a coyote song. So next time on a road trip or you're riding in the hills, your day is full of thistles or bright with daffodils, let your heart be gladdened when a coyote wanders by and give a little wave. That's just my grandpa saying hi. Oh. <laughs> Anybody could say that about a favorite uncle, a grandpa, anybody. But the other thing that um, is uh, a real hallmark, I think, of cowboy poetry is the use of humor. So can you talk about that, the humor in cowboy poetry? Well, Where I does think, that come from? I think, you, I think you have to have a good sense of humor to, to be, be a cowboy. cowboy. <laughs> you do, you do. Not to, I mean, that sounds like a generalization, but um, it's not a nine to five job and it's not a Monday to Friday job and you can't control the banks or the weather or, or the so many things that are beyond your control. And you give yourself brain damage if you, if you took every single detail so seriously that, so I guess I'm just thinking of how I grew up and all the neighbors we had and the friends I know in Cowboy Poetry Land, um, humor, that's what we all have in common. That's kind of where we all start is having a sense of humor and, you know, maybe that's, maybe that's the gift in the whole thing is it's not the perfect rhyme and meter, but just the reminder that it's, Good to have a laugh at yourself. Sure, and there's also a great deal of wordplay. There's jokes, there's puns, there's, you know, putting two words together mm -hmm. and making a new word. There's a lot of that kind of wordsmithing that goes right. on in cowboy poetry yep. too. Yeah, So it's very, so it's very creative, and um, th there is a lot of humor, and there's a lot of, a, a lot of lovely music yes. to it. And I did a CBC interview years ago, maybe it was in April, it probably was in, in April in Poetry Month, Jeff Collins, remember back in the days when oh, Jeff yeah. was uh, on the CBC home show, yep. Yep. and I was on the show with an urban poet, whatever that even is, and Jeff asked the question, what's the difference between cowboy poetry and urban poetry, and I I didn't have the nerve to say, well, people pay to listen to cowboy poetry. <laughs> <laughs> but the um, um, my my colleague, my fellow guest, he was smart and said, imagine, or here's what urban poetry is. Think of red light, green light, yellow light, jackhammers, do 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 do, you know, trucks banging. Uh, 
back and gap, stop and go traffic, and and urban poetry can sound like that. Mm -hmm. And then think of a gentle breeze with a nice horse sloping across the eastern slopes, meadowlark singing, and cowboy poetry kind of echoes that. And Great so answer. so I do think it is kind of a mirror yeah. of, of the Western way of life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you also, in your performance, you also buddy up with musicians. Yep. Specifically, can you tell us a little bit about some of the musicians and what does that bring to your performance? I love, uh, probably my favorite thing in the whole world is writing song lyrics, because then I don't, then I'm not me anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't, like when I'm, when I'm Doris Daily Cowboy Poet, I really am, like that is my grandpa, and that is our little family story. That's not taking poetic license. But when a friend sends me an idea to, and said, I'm, I'm stumped on the lyrics, or I've got this melody, Doris, you write, can you write this, can you write the lyrics? Then I can be, then I can be a soldier going off to war. I can be the, the old rancher's wife in Texas looking up at the moon. Um, they give me the story, and I have great license to sort of fictionalize who I want to be in that song. Um, plus, I have enough music in me that I, I, kn I know three-quarter time, four-four time, and so I can put the rhyme up front, or I can put it in the middle. and So it's just a real treat for me to do some Ooh. song writing. Plus, last year I made $91 on hey. my SOCAN. Uh, yes, well so, done. Yes, I'm in a new tax bracket. There now, you go. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get into a higher tax bracket. Yeah, I, just want to, I just want to get into a bracket. Yeah. <laughs> yeah a bracket of any kind. Uh, who are some of the musicians that you've that you've worked with over the years? Well, Eli Barcy is my primo. Yes. And she's she and I are doing a show in May together. Uh, Eli, her name is Alona. She's a Hungarian background. Eli is one of Canada's premier cow, I'll say cowboy singers. She's a girl, but cowboy or cowgirl, she's done remarkably well. She was just in Oklahoma City last week. She's just on her way home now presenting with Mike Martin Murphy at the, oh, yes, yeah. at the um, uh, big Western Heritage Awards. Mm -hmm. And last year she won for her album. So Eli and I started songwriting together probably 15 years ago and have had many, what we would say, successful mm -hmm. um, runs at collaborating. And then Jeannie Prescott, who is um, kind of the songbird of Texas. She's another one for whom the melody comes really quickly and the words not so quickly. Not so, much, so, right. so she'll from time she'll call me up and say, can we nice. can we um, nice collaborate? Oh I love collaborating with mm -hmm. both of those both of those mm -hmm. gals, yeah. Um, so perhaps we should talk about your new book, Poems from the Million Star Resort. So what's that title about? Tell us about the book. Well, it was five years since I had done a book, and then, so five years ago I did my previous book, and then two or three years after that in 2012, Bruce Innes and I did a tribute album to the Calgary Stampede. Oh, and Bruce Innes from, um, help me out, the name of the, the original cast. The original yes, cast, Yes, right? yes, Oh, that good was, for you. Yes, and we've got a new project in the works. Wow. So we're a, that's He's a top secret. He's a mainstay. But good yeah, for yeah, you. Yeah, 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 it was, it was Fabulous. I cool. loved working with Bruce. Loved it. Loved it. It's a well-produced album. I, I'm really proud of that one. Um, so that was 2012, and then now it was, I mean, now it's 2016, but last year was 2015, and so that had been three years since I had done anything new. And when you're in my, you know, when you're, when you're trying to make a living at this and you want to run with the big dogs, you know, I need to show up with new yes, you do. things, yeah. and I either need a br I need a huge constant supply of new audiences, which I have a few of, do, mm -hmm. or I need new things to sell to, to the existence. Yeah. Yes, right. So it was time to do a new book, and um, so this is a collection of probably everything I've written in the last four or five years, um, plus a few old favorites, plus two poems from the Irish trip, plus. Cool. Um, Plus, I dabbled a little bit in free verse. I know nothing about free verse, but I but I like to write all kinds of things. So, um, bonus, no extra charge. Buy the book, you guys. And, and if there's anything in it you don't like, if you don't like the free verse, then you just send the book back to me, and I'll send you something that I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> so in 2014, you gave a TED talk, which is something I, w I would think quite a departure from your usual kind of performance. What was that like, doing a TED? Yes, a TED talk. Well, that was huge, 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 and very, very good for me to be that sort of disciplined. It was a TEDx talk. Calgary has a TEDx chapter. And so I was one of 12 Canadians that they invited to speak on the topic um, truth. No small talk. So <laughs> it's not huge. And so, for example, the scientist, um, she's a medical scientist. I, I'm sorry, I can't remember her name. But she was the first speaker of the day. And so she joked and said, scientists don't have any truths. You can ask me what I know this year but it's going to be different than last year. And so our, our truths are always, my biggest truth is that my knowledge is always changing. So that was an interesting theme for her to develop. Um, my job, they, they gave me very good in, in direction, so I appreciated that very much. I had 16 minutes, and they told me that I was going to be number six or seven in the lineup. And by the time they got to me, they wanted something lighthearted. So Doris, come out and entertain us, and then tell us what are the truths of a 21st century woman trying to make a living as a poet when in a time when that's quite an old-fashioned mm -hmm. genre, mm -hmm. um, and to do it all in 16, 16 minutes. minutes. Yeah, so um, not much challenge there. And when I when I walked into the room, I thought, oh, what drugs was I on when I said yes to this? Because there wasn't. <laughs> I could tell by looking at the 300 people there, there wasn't one person there who grew up on a farm in Saskatchewan. Uh -huh. There wasn't one person there <laughs> who was going home to the ranch at Sundry, Alberta for, for weekends. Very urban, very mixed crowd. Oh, great. I'm going to sink or swim here. But you know what? I learned right away who goes to a TED Talk? Lifelong learners. Yeah. So they were interested in in us all. So they were in, including cowboy poetry. So they were, it was a wonderful, wonderful um, experience and it made me distill my thinking. What what are my truths as a, and what does, what, so, so you Google it online and Google it. Watch, see go. what my truths are. <laughs> but it was, it was a very, very good experience. More welcoming than than you would have thought. Yeah, I, I was honored. I was kind of strutting around the kitchen, you know. <laughs> Boy, wasn't I hot stuff to go do a TED talk? But then driving to the gig, I thought, oh, 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 I shouldn't have, yeah. What am I doing? Yeah, but um, famous last words. But but I also think that it speaks to again the universality of of you know some of the things the themes that you write about. Right. They're they're very broad and the the. Um, expression of it in cowboy poetry may be very focused, but the themes themselves are, are fairly broad. Plus, I will say, I, I love I love entertaining for audiences who are new to the West. Mm -hmm. I, I like being the welcome to cowboy poetry girl. Mm -hmm. So here were 300 people that, if you're going to get an introduction to cowboy poetry, I'm, I'm happy to be that person. and An ambassador for them. Yeah, sort of an ambassador, I guess that's a big word, but... Um, yeah, I, I am happy to be that. For, in fact, sometimes those kinds of crowds are are they're leaning forward in a way where um, the real the real rural crowds yeah um, they're, and they're and go, well, All right, show they're, me what you well got. they're watching they're waiting to not for me to trip up but they're they're waiting for somebody to say um, you said Simital and you should have said Charlet or <laughs> uh, not all. And that doesn't happen very often. But uh, I have a poem where uh, I, st I talk about a frog. So this isn't a cowboy thing, but I talk about a frog. And, uh, and then I have the tone talking in, in words reptilian because it rhymes with one in a million. Uh, there you go. Yeah. And, and you'll get called up, called up yes. for about a yeah. frog is not a reptile, right? Yes, a frog, go, so. a frog is not a, a frog, reptile. Frog. So, so there's some, not very many. I, sh mm -hmm. I don't want to. I don't want to embellish that mm -hmm. too much. But you know, I've done cowboy poetry in Washington D.C. and Ottawa and at the Saskatchewan Opera and the Eastern Townships of Quebec and and there's this love of the West and this interest in cowboy life and ranching 
life. So if I can just introduce that, if I can package that up and make and and bring and bring those visitors into a place that I love, just 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 give them a little teaser that yes, the West is alive and well, and we love living here. Then then I like being that person. That's so cool. So tell me a little bit about. We talked earlier about uh, about working with musicians uh, and and people whom you work with. But tell me a little bit about people who inspire you. Writers, poets, musicians, mm. mentors. Are there people who have really brought you along and influenced you? Um, well, maybe 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 a different way of answering that question is to say, where do I get my ideas from, or what mm -hmm. inspires me? Going to any live show. I mean, certainly not. Doesn't have to be cowboy music, but fine if it is. But oh, going to any kind of uh, house concert, um, the Flair and Derrick, and just to hear what other singers, songwriters. I, I was at a wonderful house. It's not a house concert a, a, in Colorado in January, I think. Um, I went. There's a the Pickin' Parlor. The guy, uh, my friend Kit, sells guitars and banjos, and he turns his music store into a mm -hmm. into a theater mm -hmm. once once a month. There's a special guest. And there were there was a brilliant songwriter who wrote about the Confederate flag, for example. And it started out, it's time to unstitch it. It's time to take it down. And it, it was not, it wasn't militant. It wasn't angry. It it was, it was just so beautifully done. And I'd never thought about a flag. So I'm not saying I'm going to write about the flag, but something like that just gets my brain thinking, thinking. Okay, so what's an obvious thing that I can write about from a totally different yeah. angle? So I love, I love going to live performances of, of any kind. As we were saying earlier, it gets stuff just yeah. goes in there. You're yeah. an observer. It, it yeah. gets into your head and churns around. Yeah. In the, how yeah, about, um, excuse me, how about reading? Do you read for pleasure? Do you read poetry? Do I do you read, read poetry. Fiction? Yes, I do. I read probably more poetry than I read more poetry than some, and, and less than. Some. And um, I'm the first to say that I don't like all the poetry that I, I mean, it's hit and miss. It's like vegetables. I mean, some, <laughs> no, no, you like broccoli or you don't? Know. Well, yeah, broccoli or Brussels sprouts. I mean, maybe the first four or five times you have them, not so much, but then somebody makes them in a beautiful roasted something or other. You think, oh, thank goodness I hung in there with Brussels sprouts. Now I really like them. And so I think that you can only be a good... I think you can only be a good farrier if you study horseshoeing and, and learn about the mechanics of putting a shoe on a horse, etc. You can only be a good pianist if you practice and listen to me. So I can only be a good poet if I read good yes. stuff yes. and see how others, see what I don't want to do. And sometimes that's helpful. Like, Ugh, yuck, bad syntax. Horse, of course, saddle, cattle. I mean, I can do that. Or, or to see some really beautiful treatment of the English language, whether it's fiction or I'll read anything. I'm a voracious reader, and I'll read anything if it's well written. Right. Yeah, exactly. I've just read. We have a fabulous book in our library called The Tiger, and I'm not a tiger hunter. I don't expect to go to Siberia and hunt tigers. But this was so compelling and so well written that mm, I've read that one. It's amazing. It is. So, so there's an example of a book that I may not think that I even interested in the topic, but I do appreciate how the language goes together. So we're coming to the end. I just want to read a little quote about you because I think it, it I think it says a lot about you. So, um, and I'm going to have to read this. Sorry for for reading off the page here, but so Wadi. Mitchell is one of the original cowboy poets, was on the Johnny Carson show and an ambassador for the art form. And this is what Wadi says about you. I love this. If cowboy poetry was fresh milk and the cream that rises to the top was the very best, then Doris Daly would be very rich and very fattening. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I would like to, uh, to just... Uh, uh, close by saying uh, a few things about your upcoming show, and then we'll perhaps open it up for a few questions. Sure. So, um, so don't forget, you can see Doris Daly and 
Eli Farsi um, on Friday, May 6th at the On the Edge concert series hosted by Red Deer Lake United Church, which is on Highway 22X, just on the southern edge of Calgary. It's so easy to find. And where can we find more information about that concert um, and your other books and CDs? Yes, well, go to my website, dorastanley.com, and for the tickets to the show, it's Red Deer Lake United Church, R D L U C. If you just go Red Deer Lake United Church, or you just go to my website, I have a I have connections. Okay, so we can there. we can find yes. it. All right. So, does anyone have any questions for Doris? Anybody th that I haven't asked about? Does anybody speak up or forever hold your peace? <laughs> Carson show 30 years ago when this was all starting and so is my friend Rodney Nelson who is from uh, Bis uh, from North Dakota and he was writing poetry all of these guys were writing poetry unbeknownst to each other but when they had the first gathering in Elko then they all crawled out of the woodwork and said oh I thought I just recited this to my dog oh you write this too and so Rodney was at home 
uh, in his little town of Elmont, North Dakota, population 50. And the phone rang and his wife heard him say, yeah, uh-huh, oh, several years now. Oh, quite a few, yeah. Oh, next Friday, oh, sorry, I can't. And he hung up and Terry said, who was that? Well, it was the Johnny Carson show. They wanted to fly me into Burbank to be on TV, but I told them I can't. I've got a $200 gig in, uh, in Wilmot next week. <laughs> so here's what happened. Then they phoned six months later, and Terry made sure that she answered the phone. And before she hung up, not only was Rodney going, but Terry was going. And so off they went to California, and he was on the Johnny Carson show. And uh, it all went well. And then the next morning, they were flying home. And Rodney said to himself, by golly, I, I was just on national TV. How many millions of people would have seen me last night? I, I bet when we fly home, I'm a celebrity now. I'm going to be recognized on this trip home. So they flew from Burbank, say, to Los Angeles. Nothing happened. They flew from Los Angeles to Denver. No, and he put, he looked, he's tall, and he has kind of squinty eyes, and he put on his best Roy Rogers, you know, kind of <laughs> make an eye contact with everybody he could to say, yep, that was me. Nobody recognized him. Finally, they flew from Denver to um, Rapid City, which would be, then they'd have to drive home, and just before they were going to land in Rapid City, the flight attendant had been going back and forth quite a bit, and kind of looking at Rodney, and he was looking, you know, giving her the wink and the nod, and, until finally she stopped in front of him and said, are you, are you Rodney Nelson? Why, yes, ma'am, I am, he said. I think I went to school with your sister Bridget back in 1962. <laughs> <laughs> oh, famous, yeah, famous. Yeah, so, so, so even cowboy poets have to laugh at themselves. <laughs> Doris, it's Finn. Delightful. I have so enjoyed this conversation. Is there anything else that you want to say, or do you want to do you want to end with a poem of uh, yours? No, we'll end, we'll end with that. That's oh, a, that's a good happy story. It's been we'll great. See some of you at Red Deer Lake. Thank, Thank you, Holly. Okay. It's been fun. Great. Bye, everybody.